All right. Hi. <laughs> Last time I spoke to this crowd was two years ago in Toronto. Um, all right. So um, who am I? Richard Giebriggs. And uh, yeah, James pronounced it right. And most people who've read my name on the internet uh, assume that I'm an Anglophone and get the middle name wrong. Um, so who am I? Um, so live in Ottawa, raised in Ottawa, one of the few who actually <laughs> still there uh, or native. Um, started off doing pet uh, stuff, um, assembly language, well, machine language stuff really, because uh, I was going right to the sources and, uh, and hard coding stuff. Um, then graduated to some PDP-11 and Fortran stuff. Um, computer science, oh, sorry, computer science initially at the University of Ottawa, but then switched over to computer engineering, uh, got involved with FreeSwan. Um, that's really where I, uh, uh, I guess, widened my horizons and got involved in the Linux community. Uh, that was pretty significant in terms of also introducing me to the wider world of security and the IETF and standards. Um, that was quite a fun project. Uh, worked on that for six years. Um, and then got involved with a local company in Ottawa doing uh, imager device drivers, again in the kernel. Um, then I've been with Red Hat since 2012. Um, online I'm known as uh, RGB or Sunracer. Been involved in Sun, uh, sorry, in solar car racing, which is where the Sunracer uh, handle came from. Um, weird bike guy. So this Humpty Dumpty bit, that's related to this uh, appendage that I'm carrying with me. Uh, let's see if I can, so that sort of quickly explains what this is all about. <laughs> um, that uh, happened about 200 feet in front of my house on a bridge that crosses right in the river right in front. So uh, that, the, the picture on the left was taken about uh, six days before the picture on the upper right and the bottom right. So yeah, I'd, I'm surprised I didn't actually set off the, uh, the metal detector in the airport. In fact, it was my, it was my bike cleats that set off the uh, detector in the airport. Um, yeah. So what's audit? Uh, it was introduced by Rick Faith at Red Hat in 2004. Um, and then since then, uh, it's been added to and, and um, enhanced and fixed and repaired and <laughs> patched. And <laughs> um, it's basically secure logging that's uh, embedded in the kernel itself. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, syslog um, is not a secure logging system. Um, and what's been attempted with audit is to create a system that can be uh, used in a court of, some of the logs can be used in a court of law to be able to say this attack happened, we know that this happened at this particular time, and uh, be able to uh, uh, track things down a little bit more assuredly. Um, it works well with other LSMs, uh, in particular SE Linux is the one that uh, um, it has been most closely tied to, uh, but certainly other LSMs make uh, good use of it. Um, there's a user space daemon, um, and it logs either to disk or to a network. Um, there's configurable kernel filters, so you can set up whatever filters you need in the kernel itself to be able to catch certain events so that uh, uh, various different user space uh, things are not able to be able to circumvent any of those rules or detections. There's also um, messages that can come from various different user uh, daemons and they're able to log messages into the audit system as well. So it only reports behavior. It doesn't actually interfere and get in the way. Um, Steve Grubb, one of our colleagues, has been working on a um, intrusion detection system, uh, which is related to it. So it would take information that's generated by audit, parse it, and then be able to go and act on it. But those are external to audit itself, and it simply uses audit as a mechanism to be able to trigger it. So the next problem is what are containers? There are many definitions. 
Um, and there's many people out there who've been trying to solve this problem of what is a container. And so there's various different subsets of namespaces and sec comp and C groups that have uh, been used to create containers. Unfortunately, there is no consensus in the community as to what a baseline of namespaces are required to be able to do this. If we did have a baseline of this is the minimum namespace that we need to be able to make a container, we could have already used that information and said, okay, well, we can use that as an identifier and go from there. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So the kernel has no concept of what a container is. And so we're looking for some help and it's kind of like, okay, well, we need to log some event that happened. We want to know what container did this happen in, if it happened in any container at all, or whether it was the host itself that somehow has a rogue process. So uh, the next step was um, we know that the, the container manager, the orchestrator, knows uh, this information, and so it needs to report this. So at the previous um, talk two years ago, I came up with the question of, do we go with a container ID or a collection of uh, namespace IDs? Um, there had been previous work, uh, so all right, back up a second here. So what's the problem? Um, as far as audit is concerned, uh, th there was you know the Highlander phrase: there can be only one. So previously, audit um, you start up an audit daemon, and then if you started up a second one, it would basically disconnect the first one or ignore it and continue. That's been fixed now. So if you try and start up a second one, it'll go no, you can't. There's already one running unless it somehow has died, in which case it'll replace it. Um, so the, the problems we were trying to avoid there was uh, orphaning uh, earlier ones or um, blocking out new ones. Um, the audit itself is not able to trace the task that uh, has caused a particular event to a specific container. We had looked at using a combination of namespaces and say, okay, well, this collection of namespaces was responsible for this particular event, so we should be able to trace it back and say, I think it must be this container over here because this combination was registered by an orchestrator. It, this gets really complicated and it, um, uh, I guess there are some arguments that have been made that uh, this is a user space job to be able to figure all this st stuff out but it just got really too complicated and it, it wasn't, uh, uh, we didn't have the, the certainty or the assurance that that really was the case. So uh, we tried to find another way. So the idea here is to make uh, security claims about containers um, because we're just seeing, we're, we're getting more and more people um, asking for this particular approach and say, well, we want to run a container, but we want to be able to uh, make assurances about what those containers are doing and uh, where they came from. So it's, it's part of the whole tracking mechanism that we're trying to set up. We're also needing it for, um, uh, to filter logging itself. Uh, so there may be certain containers which we're not concerned about or uh, certain um, uh, events that we don't care about. So we want to be able to filter the logging itself to reduce the amount of volume to deal with because that can uh, create a denial of service attack in terms of uh, logging stuff to disk. The other aspect, of course, is then doing searches. So if we've got the container ID, we can do a search on the particular container ID and pull up all of the events that are related to it or perhaps not related to it. Um, further down the road, we're going to be looking at how to route audit messages to different uh, daemons. So right now there is only one audit daemon, but we're still uh, doing some architecting and planning. Um, my colleague Paul Moore sitting right in front of me here is a person I'm working with on that, um, trying to come up with a uh, design or a plan. Uh, to be able to figure out how to route those messages to different audit daemons and allow more than one daemon to run at the same time, uh, which could take care of a subset of containers and be able to say, okay, well, this daemon here is responsible for that pod or whatever and be able to, to have a bit more flexibility in terms of uh, 
managing routing and where that stuff's going. So the conclusion there was that the NSID uh, namespace uh, identifiers uh, tracking was too complex and it was incomplete. In terms of history, it goes back more than, yeah, about a bit more than five years. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Aristo Rosansky, had come up with a uh, PROC inode uh, ID for each namespace and uh, tried to uh, promote that. There were some issues, uh, the namespace folks said uh, that's insufficient. So we added the device ID to be able to try and nail that down. Um, then the ID came up to use a serial number um, within the namespace instead of the PROC because the PROC inode, um, there was some reservations about we would like to reserve the right to change the meaning of this um, if things are migrated or change it uh, another time. So it came up with a serial number I prototype. It was eventually discarded because there were some concessions that, okay, this is probably getting too complicated. We need to take a step back. Um, meanwhile, Alvero reworked it for um, namespace file systems. Um, and then eventually moved on and abandoned the namespace ID as impractical and insufficient. So the namespace ID patch set, I have updated it. Uh, there's still some use for it, but it uh, is insufficient for doing the, the core stuff of tracking uh, container uh, problems. So namespace uh, concerns are still there. It's just that they're not uh, the primary concern of uh, container identification in audit events. So the conclusion from before was that there weren't any issues with um, four of the namespaces. The net namespaces were okay for now. We're gonna need to do some more work on the name, network namespaces because of the need to have multiple audit daemons. We were talking last time about having the audit daemons tied with a user namespace so that we could uh, have uh, basically one audit daemon per container and that after some discussion and more, more wrangling on mailing lists, it was determined that that really is not going to be particularly practical. Um, PID namespaces were also okay. Uh, we'll need to do proper translation, but that is, I think we understand that problem reasonably well. Um, so yeah, namespace versus container ID. I think over the last couple of years we've, we've come to our conclusion that we have to abandon the previous approach. Um, the other, the, the thing that has remained constant is that at an upper layer, um, beyond the host itself, we'll need multiple orchestrators, uh, sorry, I guess the, the higher level orchestrator that's, that's managing multiple hosts to be able to coordinate and uh, um, amalgamate those logs and be able to to uh, match up, aggregate them, and, uh, and deal with all of that. So the changes since the previous proposal, um, containers can't be universally identified by the namespace uh, subset, and so we have to move on from there. The audit daemon won't be tied to any namespace uh, because there isn't any subset that can be reliably nailed down as being this is a container. Uh, the network namespace needs a list of possible container IDs uh, responsible for network events. So the, the problem here is that you've got some events that can come in from a network and it may not be associated with a task yet and so it's kind of floating there uh, without a responsible parent sort of thing, and without a chaperone. And so we basically need to say, okay, well, this is the list of possible containers that are all sharing this names, network namespace. So it could be one of these who's responsible for this network event. Um, we looked at other namespaces and it looks unlikely that we're gonna need to do this for any others, but the code is generalized enough that if there are some other events that come up, that don't have any task associated with it, we should be able to adapt the code to be able to add that functionality into it relatively easily. So yeah, the, the namespace identifiers are still potentially useful for other audit logging, but they're not pivotal at this point and they're not reliable for what we're trying to do. Uh, one other minor thing that's come up uh, is looking at the, the task struct there are now 
three audit parameters which are in the task structure itself. And uh, it became evident that it made sense to group them all together into one pointer so that we could abstract it away. And this can solve some KEBI issues for uh, distribu distributions so that they're not going to have to worry about uh, how that, that task struct changes um, and abstract away the audit stuff entirely in within the audit subsystem itself. And so there have been some extra functions that have been added to be able to uh, get the audit information as necessary for other subsystems. So there's been three rev uh, revisions of the design uh, for the container uh, audit container identifier and four revisions of code. There's a fourth one, the fifth one that I'm eager to pull the trigger, um, but Paul needs to find some CPU cycles to be able to review patch set four. So in terms of access controls, um, we don't want to be able to unset the container ID. Uh, so that's once it's set, basically it's, it's stuck there and can't be changed. We started off with only having uh, write uh, access mitigate or limited by cap audit control. And there's been a concern about abusing this particular identifier for other uh, subsystems. And uh, so we're um, not trying to be terribly creative about how those could be abused by other systems, but we want to be very careful about it. And so we've added read uh, access um, control as well. Um, it, it's basic, at this point, it's a, uh, in the proc um, file system, uh, under each uh, process ID, there'll be a new, um, uh, a new file system entry, which is called con uh, audit container ID. And you would do a write into there uh, to be able to set the containers um, audit uh, container identifier. And uh, then you'd be use the same uh, file to be able to read it back, but only if you've got permission. Uh, other limitations. So we don't want to be able to uh, have, play games with having a child that's been set with a container ID go back and then turn around and have it set the parent's container ID. So at this point, it looks like a sufficient uh, access control for that would be to prevent it being set if that task has already spawned a thread or spawned a child. Uh, at this point, uh, well, I, I don't think there's going to be any argument with this down the road, is the child itself is going to inherit its parent's audit container identifier. Um, and so once it's set, uh, initially we were talking about uh, restricting it so that if it's already been set once, it can't be set a second time. If it's inherited from the parent, there was a mechanism to be able to still allow it to be set once. And initially that was by comparing the parent's container identifier with the child's container identifier. And if they were identical, allow it to be set again. That was changed around to actually look at an inheritance flag. And that's been since removed because uh, th some of the concerns about setting the container identifier a second time have been um, questioned. Um, there's another angle to it, which is to possibly restrict the uh, setting of the uh, container audit container identifier by one of the or uh, sorry one of the sorry <laughs> to one of the children of the orchestrator itself, so that the orchestrator can't just go outside of its own tree and start setting other children, because you might actually have more than one orchestrator running on a system. Seems unlikely, but that's the kind of thing that we, we've considered. Uh, we haven't made that decision yet. Um, so the last point is about disabling, um, setting the um, uh, container identifier twice, and that's been removed. Um, so at this point, it looks like we will be able to set it a second time. So in terms of what the identifier would be, uh, we started off, uh, I don't remember exactly how I started off, 
some of the discussions, I think I might have actually started off at U64, but then it went back and forth a number of times. U128 seemed to make most sense because a UUID is uh, 128, which is what a lot of container uh, orchestrators are using. That gives us enough uh, overhead that we, we were a bit concerned about it. Paul really would like to see a U32, but has conceded, conceded a U64 should be enough to be able to give us enough uh, bits to play with so that uh, collisions are unlikely. Um, the, at the other upper end of things, a uh, uh, 36 char um, string was also considered, but that looks to be far too large. And if we're doing logging um, and we've got a, a record, an audit record for every event, then that's gonna chew up a fair amount of bandwidth and we wanted to reduce it to as much as was sufficient to be able to avoid collisions, but not, uh, um, not big enough to chew too much bandwidth. So the, part of the argument here is that we should be able to enlarge it to a U128 in the future if it really is deemed necessary and it shouldn't break stuff. Um, at this point, in terms of records, there are two new records that are being proposed. One is the initial record when a uh, audit container identifier is first set, and that would give some of the background, like who's the parent, who's the the parent, the container orchestrator who's setting this, what's the target PID, um, and some other information about uh, the the circumstances to be able to nail it down and identify who the players are. Uh, the other uh, record would be an audit container auxiliary record to syslog uh, events, uh, syscall events, sorry, um, if, only if the container identifier is set. So if it's not set, the record simply doesn't show up. Um, there's a new field uh, that's been added for kernel um, user space communication. Uh, it's a U64 and uh, I guess this is dives into some of the implementation details, but we've only got U32s available, and so I sort of welded two of them together to be able to make it work. Um, it, I'm fairly confident that there won't be a problem. Otherwise, I would have had to change the interface and pass it in as a string, which just seemed far more messy. Um, and of course, uh, need to add and delete container identifiers from network namespaces. So when a task uh, gets a container identifier, we look at its network namespace and we add the container identifier to that network namespace so that if there's an event that happens, it's able to list all of the uh, potential containers who are involved. If there's a second process that's in the same network namespace, then it will uh, add it to a list, and then if an event happens, then it will go through and itemize each one of the potential container identifiers that are involved in, in that particular event. What remains to be addressed uh, is how we're gonna allow multiple audit daemons to be able to run on one machine. So at this point, uh, we would have to solve some of the network namespace issues. Uh, they don't seem too daunting at this point, um, but there are some concerns that we'll have to uh, take care of. Each one would have its own uh, rule set and its own uh, queue. So if you've got a separate audit daemon running, it's gonna monitor a set of things, and it could overlap with other audit daemons, that's fine. Um, each one is going to receive those messages as is required. Um, the other big one is that auxiliary audit daemons not be able to affect the, the, the host configuration or the host audit daemon. Um, so right now, audit, uh, when it starts up, there are a number of parameters that are set and uh, they influence the host itself. Uh, those have to be disabled in the auxiliary daemons. Um, this isn't uh, a significant challenge. Um, so the next one is how to assign and route audit messages by container identifier. Uh, 
And this requires some architecture work that we haven't uh, looked at particularly seriously yet. Um, it's a matter of setting up a configuration file for each audit daemon um, that is not going to interfere with or uh, tamper with the host itself. Um, something that Paul has mentioned recently is the need for LSM hooks to be able to set the container identifier itself on various tasks. Um, that's most of the concerns at this point. So in conclusion, um, the namespace identifier was infeasible to track containers itself and had to move on beyond that uh, to try and find something that was uh, easier to implement and a lot easier to be able to track. Um, the 64-bit uh, unsigned balances kernel efficiency with uniqueness. Um, coming back to that, uh, a U64 um, is a single operation to do a compare in the kernel, whereas if a, a U128 would have been multiple uh, compares. Um, so if we're, if we're trying to manage lists of audit daemons and routing and that kind of thing, then those compares could have added up. So we've got uh, a record, a new record now for each of uh, creation and uh, routine events that, that happen. Um, and there's now a filter in place to be able to uh, filter on that container identifier. Um, the net namespace isolated events get special treatment. If we have other things that come along, then that could uh, also. I'm, the only other thing I'm thinking of that could be in that sort of class is some sort of hardware failure where maybe you've got a disk that gets a bad sector or something like that and it's gonna throw some thing that is monitored by audit and it doesn't belong to any particular task. And it might say, okay, I need to report this event. Um, and again, these uh, audit logs at a higher level would need to be uh, aggregated by an, or, uh, an orchestrator that's at a higher level than the host itself. Um, and the orchestrator would keep track of all of these different IDs across the various different hosts. That's it. Um, contact information uh, can reach me at Red Hat, RGB at Red Hat, or at home, um, RGB at Tricolor. Um, the Linux audit mailing list would be the canonical place to be able to raise questions about this and uh, get involved in development. Um, there's also a free node uh, audit channel uh, if you've got questions, but um, I'm the only one from Red Hat that's in there, so uh, I'll probably redirect you to the mailing list. Anyway, there it is. Questions? Casey? Yeah, I know. Anybody else? Uh, what about nested containers? What about nested containers? Uh, a container okay. that throws off a container that throws off a container because people do weird things like that. Yeah, we're expecting that. And the logs should be able to uh, elucidate that story. And that's a, a tracking problem that will punt to user space. And basically, the, the information's there about this particular orchestrator spawned a process, which was another orchestrator. And it will have the, the, the information for the container IDs of both the parent and the child. And then when it goes to spawn a new one, then that information will be in there. Does that sufficiently answer you? Good. This, this is actually a bit of a contentious question because it had come up before and it was the subject of uh, a lot of discussion back and forth and, and influenced uh, some of the uh, design decisions. Yep. So what kind of overhead does Audit D and its associated management introduce? Uh, I don't have those numbers, but they've been around for more than a decade. <laughs> 
So there have been improvements over yeah. time. So like everything, right? There's no good, easy answer for that. Like I can't just say, oh, 4%. <laughs> um, so one of the things we were just talking about is over the past couple years, the queuing mechanism inside the kernel for um, audit event generation has gotten much better. It used to be we were doing a lot of awful things, sending Netlink messages up on syscall exit. We've now moved that off to a separate thread inside the kernel um, so that that should improve things quite a bit. So you've got a separate thread doing all of your Netlink messages up to the audit daemon so that they can be collected and written off to a disk. Um, but in general, AuditD is really just a collector. You know, I mean, we don't want to write to disk directly from the kernel, right? That's bad. Um, so the AuditD itself doesn't really provide any sort of overhead. It's all going to be the audit processing inside the kernel. Um, as far as what that overhead is going to be for any individual operation, it depends entirely on what your audit configuration is. Um, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're generating audit records for every syscall on the system, um, guess what? The overhead's going to be pretty bad. Um, the good news is we will actually, that's fine. You can actually start up the system and it'll operate. It'll operate very slowly, but it will operate and you can then shut it down. It used to be that wasn't the case. Um, but anyway, there are filters that you can put into the kernel that happen at event generation time. So you can mitigate that overhead to whatever you want it to be. You know, like everything in security, there's a big knob, right? How much information do you want and what are you willing to pay for it? You can filter out individual events or classes of events. You can also filter out uh, records. So if there's certain records you don't want to see, then the record itself won't be generated whereas the rest of the event will still uh, show up. Um, currently, there's a pretty heavy use of uh, printf in those messages, and there's a lot of overhead associated with that. So down the road, we're looking at changing the API for audit to uh, basically give binary uh, information in a more organized way so that it causes fewer problems for the user space parsers to be able to uh, look for patterns in the logs. Um, that's ongoing work. Somebody at the back. So do you have buy-in from the other kernel developers for this? Container ID and I, the primary one that I was concerned with is Eric Biederman, who's the namespace guy. Uh, he had some pretty strong opinions about this stuff. Um, trying to think who else was pretty vocal about it. Most of the rest of it were user space and orchestrator and library folks who had mostly opinions about the user, about the identifier itself, about the size of the identifier. Um, there, like I said, it's been, it's gone through seven rev, um, revisions of namespace identifiers and now four revisions of the container identifiers and we've addressed pretty much all of the concerns that any of the, concernal, the kernel developers have, have got. Um, yeah, I guess it, the, I would like to get more involvement from the uh, container orchestrator folks because they're the ones ultimately who are going to have to deal with this and use it. Um, it's, it's important to note, and, and this may sound like a silly thing, but this is an audit container ID. This isn't a container ID. We're not proposing this as a general purpose container ID for use by the kernel. We're, we're creating this because we needed to solve problems with audit, and so we're intending this only to be used by audit. If you look at the mailing list threads, there's a lot of discussion back and forth. And this is, Richard touched upon this a little bit where he was talking about, we didn't even want to allow user space to read the value out because we're very afraid and we're very worried that people are gonna take this and run with it and use it for things other than audit. So we're taking a lot of steps to prevent that from happening. And this is one of the reasons we've got, been able to get by in this time around. We're not proposing this as a general purpose. Yeah, because we're narrowing the scope sufficiently that other people are less concerned about 
uh, how they're going to be able to abuse it. Uh, so I hate to rehash on a uh, on an, on a the, one of the flames we had during that uh, mailing list thread. Um, one of the ideas proposed was to introduce uh, p tags finally, so that you could then instead of having a specific feature for tagging uh, for containers for audit, you would be able to have like a like audit would be able to piggyback on top of p tags, so that it wouldn't be all this special casing where we have to worry about is this really what the kernel says a container is? Has that been looked at since then, or is it sort of? Not it was case? pretty much discarded because p tags is isn't in the mainline kernel, and p tags is an LSM. And on both counts, because there's a dependence there that it's not part of current core kernel functionality, it's not going to be very useful to us or reliable. Does that answer the question? Any more questions? Over here again. So with regards to the log aggregation at the orchestrator level, will that data be normalized so that it can be ingested by other systems? Uh, there's already been work done to normalize uh, audit logs anyway, and that's been a lot of the preparatory work that's gone, or I guess, uh, I don't want to dismiss it as being a distraction, but that's been a lot of the distraction that's led up to this point as we've got a lot of work to do there simply to make all of the events uh, parsable. And so that's been an interest of the audit uh, user space tool maintainer anyway, um, is to make sure that we were able to parse all of these events because those events are eventually going to be parsed by other tools even further up. And so cleaning up our act there um, has helped in other layers anyway. I think that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks.